reminder from last class period. So last class period we talked about Irish immigrants and Chinese immigrants. And if you remember, both of them come out of poverty in an attempt to be able to get a better place. The Irish in particular come because of the Irish potato famine. We talked about what they were like when they came here and what they did. But now we're going to see what the real amounts of racism are going to come from with the Irish. And it has to do with their religion. So, what religion are the Irish? They are Catholic, okay? Now, the thing is, though, in America during this time, what is America? We are Protestant. And do you think we like Catholics? No, no way. So instead, we don't like the idea. Sorry, I got messed up here. Okay? We don't like the idea of having these Catholics. Now, when it comes to this controversy over Catholics and Protestants, uh, it can come to a pretty violent head. So, for example, a couple years ago, there was a rugby match between the Irish and the English national teams. They had not played together on home ground for about 35 years. Now, they decided to compete in about 30 minutes into this contest. The entire bench from both sides got into a massive brawl. About half the team was sent to the hospital. Some of them were in medically induced comas. Then the entire crowd began to fight each other to the point where about 300 people were arrested. Now, why would they hate each other so much? It goes all the way back to the 1400s all about religion. So if you took AP Euro, I don't know if you learned this in AP Euro, but maybe you did. But at this time, the Romans are taking over basically everybody. So what happens is, is that the Norman invasion, which occurs in about 1400, 1500, is that the Romans are going to go in and they're going to conquer the Irish. Now, while they get pushed back very quickly, what happens is, is that Ireland becomes extremely Catholic due to this original invasion. Now, in terms of Catholicism in Ireland, Catholicism becomes extremely popular all throughout Ireland. You can see from this map is that the vast majority of Ireland is going to be uh, Catholic. And then, as you can see in the top right-hand corner, uh, very small amounts of non-Catholics. Now, what religion do you think that they are? They are Protestant. And why are they up in that top right? What's right next to that area? Is nor uh, well, this is Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland is right above. That's owned by England, and that's why the Protestantism comes in there. Now, in terms of Catholicism in Ireland, who's this dude? It's not Jesus. <laughs> this is Saint Patrick. Okay. Uh, so Saint Patrick was a saint in the Catholic religion who lives in Ireland. Now he began to have several revelations. Uh, regarding the Catholic religion. One day as he was walking along in the Glen in Ireland, he discovered that there were several clovers, oh, that's St. Patrick, all over the ground. Now, you guys know clovers from St. Patrick's Day. And why do we celebrate clovers and things like that? Well, that's because he had this revelation about what those clovers actually meant. Does anybody know what a clover represents? It's the Trinity. I think that's actually the first person that's ever guessed it. So it represents the Holy Trinity. So you can see that he basically sees and it confirms to them that the Trinity is one and it's also these three different things all into one. Uh, and he uh, says that this is a manifestation that the Trinity is a real thing. Now you might say, well, then why do we try to find four leaf clovers on St. Patrick's Day? The fourth leaf is you in the Catholic religion believing in the Trinity. That's what the four leaf clover is. Now, in terms of St. Patrick's Day altogether, what is one other thing that people like to consume a whole lot of on St. Patrick's Day? Alcohol. Alcohol. Now, of course, we're talking about root beer, okay? But here in America, beer is the number one drink of choice on St. Patrick's Day. However, that's actually completely inaccurate because over in Ireland, they don't drink beer. What do they drink in Ireland? They drink whiskey, okay? So all these people in Ireland drink all this whiskey and then we drink all this beer, but we'll talk about why beer is a thing here in America. Now, in terms of the impact of this on uh, America, it has to do with the drinking. St. Patrick's Day is the number one holiday in the United States for alcohol-related deaths and DUIs. Anybody know what number two is? New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. And number three? Fourth of July. Some of you were saying, 
way I've never heard some of the uh, Halloween, like Halloween's. I've never had somebody guess that, but that's really close. Uh, so, anyways, so in terms of the amount of DUI deaths, it's really, really high um, on St. Patrick's Day. Now, by the way, if you want to put uh, next to your Irish notes the reasons why we hated the Irish, number one is job competition, which is always going to be the first answer. Number two is going to be the Protestant versus Catholicism. Number three is the alcohol due to temperance and prohibition. Now, other things about St. Patrick's Day. I don't know if people still do this, but this was like really big when I was a kid. Is on St. Patrick's Day, you try to catch leprechauns. Did you guys do that when you were a kid? I, I don't know if that's like old school or not, but like you do little traps. Somebody in my 2A class says that they have caught a leprechaun before, so that's really cool. Uh, but when a true leprechaun is, though, it is not these cute little figures that you see on the right that we think in America. Instead, these leprechauns are actually quite savage. So where they get all their gold from is they steal from people. So they go into your house, they steal all your gold, and the idea of, a, of a, that the leprechaun, if you catch him, will give you his pot of gold is like trying to find it to get your money back. So that's where it comes from. So leprechauns are actually quite mischievous. They're not very positive. So let's look at the Irish flag, though. A lot of people look at the Irish flag and they're like, I, I don't get it. The green represents what religion? Is the Catholics, okay? So what does this random orange thing happen? Well, if you know all the Protestants in Ireland, begin to feel like they are discriminated against. They create an organization, which their color is orange, to be able to combat this racism against them by the, uh, pro or by the Catholics. And this is actually still an order that you can go into, into today. So a lot of the Protestants are members of this order. But let's go back to what that uh, flag looks like. So the green represents what? Catholics. Catholics. What does the orange represent? Catholics. And what do you think the white is peace. So what happened is in the 1800s, they signed an agreement that said you will no longer fight over religion. That's this idea of peace. Now, in terms of Ireland today, Ireland is extremely, extremely Catholic today. Very, very strict laws. Um, for example, LGBTQ stuff, that is all banned in Ireland. They just barely allowed abortions for, this time, for the first time about two years ago, but only in cases where the mother's life is in danger. Um, all the rest is banned. So it is still extremely, extremely religious and strict in Ireland. So in terms of what do you see when you look at political cartoons? Now, you'll notice that the Irish are typically drawn very bad. Uh, they'll always have usually alcohol in their hands. They'll always have some sort of a giant nose or something to do with Catholicism into it. So let's look at some of them where they are trying to show what the problem is with the Catholics. So if you notice in this image... So, over here, who are the guys on the left showing up? Who are these guys? So, these are the Catholics, right? The Catholic Irish. If you notice, he's hooking America, so he's bringing this Catholicism to the United States. The priest is coming in and bringing his religion, that's what his staff is for, into America. Now, the poor, lonely boy with the Holy Bible and the Protestantism, he's about to be attacked by the sword of the Catholics. And Uncle Sam, all he has is a little hatchet to defend, but of course, the Catholics have the sword. This is basically showing how the Catholics are going to come in and they are going to kill religion in America. Now, I'm going to show you the next image, which in my opinion is probably one of my favorite images ever. Hi. Bye. Do you forgive me, by the way? Yeah. Okay. Right. I'm probably going to ask you that every single time. Okay. Bye. Okay. So... I'm going to show you probably one of my favorite political cartoons that I love. And that's this one. And the reason why is if you're an artist, it is so creative how they drew this. You notice there are crocodiles. What are the crocodiles? They are the Catholic priests. So if you notice, if you can't see it, by the way, I'll kind of show you. So if you look right here. The hats, which are the teeth, are actually the Catholic priest hats. Uh, the eye is actually just like gems on the Catholic priest hats. You can see the face right here. The claws are the hands. And you can see up here that the back ones are the legs. And then you have the cloak, which is the back. So what this is actually says, it says the priests and the children. 
And if you notice, you have the poor, like, Protestant children on the right that are being attacked by the Catholic crocodiles. Um, and then if you notice, like, they're about to go and eat all these little children over here. You can see that it has the school, which is also the church house. Um, that is being destroyed. What is in the background? The As the U.S. Capitol. What's the top of the U.S. Capitol now? It is the cross, which means that America is being taken over by religion. And if you notice in the top right-hand corner, a woman is actually being carried away to the gallows, which are in the top, top right. So if you notice, all this is referring to all of that death and possibility of coming from the Catholics. So if you will star the Catholic Protestant thing, if you're going to get, and they have never done a DBQ on immigration, and there's been a huge thing. Um, we just did a survey in my little AP Facebook group of what the next one's going to be. Uh, right now, the top choices are Jackson, Market Revolution, or immigration during this time period. So, study, study, study. Now, in terms of the Germans, we hate the Irish, we hate the Chinese, we love the Germans. So, really the Germans are our odd one now and how much we love them. So, if you will highlight, they came with more resources and wealth. So while everybody else comes in impoverished, the Germans come in with a lot of knowledge, a lot of resources, and a lot of job skills. These are doctors, teachers, things like that. Now, they are also, if you will highlight, more sophisticated. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. So when the Germans come in, they are not coming because they need to come. They are coming for fun. So for example, let's say I'm scrolling through Facebook, and I see one of my friends, not really friends, but acquaintance from high school, and they say, you know, on a whim, I just decided to move to Thailand for a couple of months. And they just, like, go to Thailand. Or I had somebody else that says, you know, I'm sick of the snow in Utah. I'm just going to move to Costa Rica. And they move to Costa Rica for a year. These are the people that are moving for adventure, for knowledge, for excitement, not for necessity. And I think that's part of the reason why people like them more is because they're moving here for an excitement and a new thing rather than needing uh, desperation in terms of poverty. So let's talk about what we can thank the Germans for. So if you've ever said to yourself, why can I thank a German today? Here's what you can thank them for. Uh, oh, by the way, this graph, I just want to point out, these are the spikes in the German immigration. So you can see we're in the first spike right now. So first off is school. Prior to this time, uh, Americans did not have free public education. Horace Mann did some, but most of America did not have this. You had to be rich. Well, all these Germans come over, they go to enroll their kids into school, and they say, no, we don't have free public education there. Well, they say, well, back at home, they had what? Anybody know the German thing that we have in our schools? Kindergarten. What does kinder mean? It's child or kid. So they say, well, we have these kindergartens back in Germany. Why don't you have them there? And it starts the very first early childhood education that's free. So you get basically public education from kindergarten through first grade. That gives you basic reading, writing, and math skills. Like basic, 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 where you can be able to survive in theory with a little bit of knowledge. So you can thank all of the Germans for why you're at Skyline today. Because it starts our education system in America. Now, next thing you can thank them for is your weekend. Who likes the weekend? Pretty much everybody. Some of you aren't raising your hands. Well, I hope you like this weekend at least. So why we get thank you for the weekend? Prior to this time, uh, Americans work six days a week, 12 hours a day, and you get Sunday off for the Sabbath. That's what you worked. Well, the Germans came over, and they said, well, wait a second. We have stuff that we want to do. And in Germany, there were all these vacation areas. So you had, for example, you could go to the pool. You could go to the opera, the orchestra. You could go to theme parks. Uh, where they had all these different rides and things like that. They had parks. And people said, I don't want to spend all my time in a workplace. I want to go and do stuff. And so they refused to work. If a business said you had to work six days a week, they said no. Or they walked off the job on the weekend and they left. And because of that, that starts the creation of the weekend and the start of vacations where people go. Yeah. It's like kind of a British idea too. They have like a... Yes, but you have to remember at this time, do we like the British? No. So the thing is, all across Europe, this idea of the weekend is spreading, but the Germans bring it over because we're not going to listen to the British, right? It's kind of like, for example, let's say that your uh, mom comes up to you and is like, I don't think that that outfit is appropriate. 
You can be like, I don't care about what my mom says. But then if a friend comes, you're like, oh, I care about what you say now. So it's the idea that we didn't really trust the British. So, but this is a whole European idea. It just bring, is brought over by the Germans for America. Yeah. Yeah, so the six days goes to five days, but you do increase the workload to about 15 hours a day. So you're working about 15 hours, but you do get a weekend, and you do start to go on vacations. And this is going to especially change in the late 1800s. Now, other things that you can thank them for when you turn 21 years old. You can thank them for beer. Because the Germans are going to bring over their beer, which is also America's number one alcohol that we consume. We actually consume the most beer in the world. Uh, Germany consumes in terms of per capita, but in terms of gallons and things like that, we consume the most. Now, when you are 21 years old and you begin to drink alcohol, or never at all because alcohol is bad, so you don't have to ever do it, okay? But one thing that's really interesting about Germany is if you ever go to Germany, you will know something very interesting about the beer. So a couple years ago, I went on a teacher trip where like, they took 30 teachers and they paid for all of us to go to Germany for two weeks to learn about it. And while I was there, they said, we're going to pay for all your meals, and you get for every meal a main course, a dessert, and two glasses of alcohol. So that's what we were given. Well, I don't drink any alcohol. And so I, instead of giving the alcohol, I was given free appetizers, which is way better, because I had a three-course meal for every meal. Well, what I noticed is when they would get the bill back, and if you've ever been to Europe, you know that if, for in terms of drink options, they don't have still water in most of European countries. They have sparkling, which is honestly the worst thing in the whole world because it tastes absolutely awful and disgusting. No, it is, it is horrific. Yes, Brie, or not Brie, I don't know why I said that. A student brought that in because they sell it at Costco. And like that was our, it was for a party and I think it was an AP student. And that was the only drink anybody brought. And literally I could, like I was trying to be nice but I was like gagging. I think sparkling water is the worst thing in the whole world. No, it's not. Because when I flew home, they, didn't, they were out of all sodas and all they have is sparkling water and I was forced to drink it and I would rather have died because it was so bad. Now, in terms of, Kaylison, okay, it's an acquired taste, I would say, in terms of drinking. Uh, but anyways, so I didn't want to drink that. So the only thing I could really drink, because actually still water in Europe is extremely expensive. It's about $8 a bottle for a tall bottle, which is the equivalent of about eight glasses. It's extremely expensive. They don't have tap water. Uh, and so what happens instead is I drink soda. Well, I would get the bill back, and my soda costs $4 a glass, but the beer costs $1.25. So I actually spent more money on my own drinks than the beer. And the reason why is because beer is everywhere. And so when you go to Germany, every single place you go to has beer. The McDonald's have beer, for example. Uh, it's just really, really commonplace. Now, interestingly enough, about, uh, so you can, whoever just mentioned, it's not 15 that you can drink, you can drink at 16 in Germany. I heard it. I heard it last year. At 15. <laughs> okay. You can, you can drink beer when you're 15. <laughs> well, in, in general, most of the places, though, will not allow you to drink until you're 16. It's like, it's, it's the year, I think 16 is the and then like 18 is like hard alcohol. Right. But what I'm saying is the vast majority of places won't allow you till you're 16 to avoid that beer versus the other things. But hey, it's great to know that you drink beer in Germany. Uh, but that is a bad thing, and you should not do that because your brains are not developed until you're 21. So, so don't drink alcohol. Al you don't have to drink it at all either. Just don't ever do it, and you'll be just fine. Okay, anyways, going back into this, but if you go to Germany, one thing that you will notice is that German beer is different than all other beers. Now, hopefully you don't know this about American beer because you should not drink until you're 21, unless maybe your parents know this and they've told you this, but uh, here in America, we have a lot of flavored beers. So for example, I've seen beers that are apple flavored, I've seen citrus flavor, there's spring versions, fall versions, all these different flavors of beer that does not exist in Germany. In Germany, you are only by law allowed to have four ingredients in your beer. You cannot add anything else into your beer. It's against the law because uh, they want to keep it a pure beer. And uh, you can change it based on the fermentation time and the amount of ingredients, but it's 100% pure. So it's very, very different than American beer, um, although Americans do drink quite a bit more. So anyways, so what do Germans bring to America, though? Beer. And it becomes so synonymous. So that's why when we get to St. Patrick's Day, we're all drinking beer. 
Now, other... Uh, okay, sorry guys, I got an alert to update my computer, so I have to go back over here. So, other things that you need to care about. Well, there's something else that happens. You see, in Germany, there is a saint in the Catholic religion known as Saint Nicholas. Saint Nicholas cares a lot about his community and wants to make sure that people are going to make sure that they are being good. And so what he did is throughout the year, he would go back and forth to different houses and he would keep a list of whether or not people were being very good throughout the year and very bad throughout the year. Now, at the end of the year, people began to celebrate this in coinciding with, in theory, Christ's birth, and it became a holiday that is known as Christmas. Now, real Christmas, if you're talking about the birth of Christ, if you know anything about the Bible, it's actually in the spring, and the Easter is actually in the fall or in the in December. So here in America, we were celebrating Easter, but we were not ever celebrating Christmas. Christmas was not a thing in America until the Germans came along. So what did the Germans believe about St. Nicholas? Well, they believed, first off, that you should be able to count down to when St. Nicholas comes to tell you if you were good or bad. So they had these things called an Advent wreath, which today in America is called an Advent calendar. And what they would do is they would put the, you can see the nativities in the center, and then you have four different candles. Each candle begins to burn and uh, per week, and then at the end, you, uh, you have all the candles that come together. And once they all burn out, that is when St. Nicholas is going to come to your house. Now, another thing is the nativity. So while here in America we have the regular nativity, in true German culture, you have the uh, nativity pyramid. And so in Germany, this is, so if you can see the second and third tier, each of those are going to have um, part of the nativity set. And then you put it outside of your house, the windmill at the top goes around and it spins the whole thing and also plays a musical chime. Uh, every year around Christmas time, they have a Christmas German market. It's up near Hogel Zoo every year. It's uh, like December 5th this year, I believe it is. And they uh, have these for sale. The cheapest one is about $200. It's about two feet high. And the most expensive one is about $500 for a five foot one. So they can be extremely expensive to be able to buy. So also the Germans bring over this idea of the Christmas tree, which all the lights that are on there used to be candles that lights the way for Christ to come to the earth. So all these become very famous traditions, but what do most people in today's world care about with Christmas? The presents. So let's talk about what it was back then. So as St. Nicholas, you prepare for his arrival by showing him how good you are. So you begin to massively clean your house. If you want a great new Christmas tradition, you can adopt this German tradition of spending the seven days before Christmas cleaning constantly your house. Because if you think about it, it's kind of like inviting Christ to your house. Would you want Christ to come to your house and see a whole bunch of dirty socks and underwear on your floor? No. So you prep it and make it very, very nice for St. Nicholas's arrival. Now, when he goes to arrive, one of the things you do too is you polish your shoes for about 10 to 12 hours. Make sure you're staying off your cell phones. And you polish your shoes because on Christmas Eve, you place your shoes outside of your door and you place carrots into the shoe. This is the equivalent of a stocking and cookies for Santa. Now, the reason the carrots are there is because St. Nicholas comes on either a white horse or a white donkey, and the carrots go to the horse or the donkey. Now, when he arrives, he is going to give you presents based on if you are good or bad. Anybody know what you get if you are good in traditional culture? You get nuts and candies. If you're bad, what do you get? Coal. Okay? So each of these are going to be if you are not good. Now, as time goes on, we introduce the idea of the presents. This is especially an American idea of having different presents instead of having these different things. Okay? Yeah. Oh, Chase, you didn't have a question? No, I didn't. Okay. And so what happens is people begin to send letters to St. Nicholas requesting that they are able to get different things. Now, in terms of as time went on, St. Nicholas now, instead of bringing the candy and things like that in the late 1800s, it converts to now bringing presents for all the little children. Now, if you look at comparisons between Germany and the United States, we borrowed a whole bunch of stuff from Germany. So if you want to put that the major impacts from Germany 
So the major impacts from Germany, number one is we like them. Number two is beer, which also goes into the temperance prohibition thing. And number three is we took traditions from them. We borrowed them. So again, this is the difference between the two different ones of what you will see. But let's talk about your presence because as you guys all know, who creates your guys' presence? Santa. No, not Santa. Santa's busy. Santa's Hit. <laughs> no. Not Santa's slaves, his elves. Okay? Now, Santa's elves all go to make your wonderful little presents and then on Christmas Eve, they help Santa deliver this. Are you playing a game? Yeah. Oh, okay, you're just pressing a whole bunch of buttons and we're not doing anything, so I just want to make sure. You're just playing with the buttons? Okay. So, anyways, so the thing is, though, in traditional German culture, there are no elves. Instead, anybody know what they have instead? They have what we call in America the Krampus. Now, if you've ever heard of the Krampus, there was an office episode about this. Is that the Krampus, which is called something else in Germany, this is instead of having an elf. This is basically the equivalent of the devil. So while St. Nicholas is good, if you are so bad that they need to take it a step further, the Krampus is going to be the solution. So if the if St. Nicholas decides that you are too naughty and you should not only receive coal but even worse circumstances, he sends the Krampus to your house. On Christmas Eve night, the Krampus comes to your house, steals you away, takes you into the woods, and eats you alive. So instead of having a cute little elf on the shelf, now it's a devil that's coming to eat you because you're bad. So if you ever want a really good parenting technique, this could be something that you guys can introduce to your kids to get them to be good throughout the year. Maybe you'll have somebody kidnap them and like dress up as the Krampus because they're being bad. I don't know what you'll do. Okay. Now, another thing. Okay, listen. Another thing that Germans do, though, is that Germans are highly sophisticated. And we talk about the sophistication. Let me give you one example. In Germany, it is a big deal to have music and different things like that. Several famous composers. Who is this house's? Who's this house? It's Bach. It literally says it on the right-hand statue. So this is Bach. Uh, his house is in Eisenach, which is about two hours away from Berlin. And when I went to uh, this house, they showed all these different pianos, for example, that he invented. So a lot of the modern-day pianos were helped and invented by with Sebastian Bach. And you've heard a lot of his music before in the past. But there is something else at the Bach house that is so wonderful and amazing that I'm sure all of you will run to the Bach house and be able to see. The most popular thing in the entire Bach house has a little bit to do with Bach, but not so much his music. And that has to do with his 450-year-old what? Toilet. Okay? No, not cheese. <laughs> that cheese. Okay? Now, Sebastian Bach's toilet is extremely popular to go and visit. It's about 450 years old. It is two stories high. If you think of how a porta potty works, it's two stories high, and then it dumps into something on the ground, which then goes into the sewer system. Now, in terms of this toilet, it was so popular that everybody's favorite thing to do was to put their butt where Sebastian Bach's butt was. And so it was really popular that people would go to the museum and they would go and they would open the toilet and they would put their butt where the other butt was. And then sometimes they would also take that opportunity to make sure the toilet still works. And this became a huge problem. And they put security guards and they would distract the security guards and then run over and use the toilet. And it became such a problem that they put a plexiglass wall in front of the toilet and then people would break down the toilet and people were breaking into the house and breaking down this wall so that they could go and use the toilet. And it's so bad that nowadays there is actually a four inch bulletproof glass in front of the toilet that you are no longer allowed to actually go and use the toilet and you can't break it down. So unfortunately you guys missed your opportunity. Sorry. But 
When we talk about the Germans in America, though, this is what we talk about with the sophistication. So it says, one American visited an isolated German community in the southwest where people drank coffee and tin cups while listening to a Beethoven symphony on the grand piano. They were very much sophisticated. Now, in terms of uh, propaganda against the Germans, there's not a ton of propaganda that you'll find. This is the only major negative one that I have seen. If you notice, it has the Irish whiskey and it has the German beer on the right. And then it has the ballot box, which is basically carrying the ballots. Um, and that basically is implying the immigrants are stealing the votes. But really, there's not a lot about the Germans. The Germans were pretty well accepted. Now, all together, though, if you will star this term, the Know Nothing Party gets created in an attempt to be able to get rid of these immigrants. If you will highlight that this is mostly going to be the Whigs, so if you will highlight that this is going to be the Whigs, and if you will star that second bullet, they were anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic. Now what they're going to do is that they're going to believe in what is known as, if you will highlight, nativism. Nativism is the idea that you only like Native Americans. Do you think I'm talking about Indian Native Americans? No. no, I'm talking about Native Americans, which at this time it is believed that the first Americans were the Anglo-Saxon white Americans that came over during European colonization. So what they supported was the true Native white Americans. We actually see this today. There are several nativists today that say that America should only be white and we should not allow any other immigrants in because of this. That is a nativist ideology. So in terms of the know-nothings, why were they called the know-nothings? Well, this is what they would do. They would find an immigrant group, an immigrant church, whatever it could be. They would then go over, light it on fire. A bunch of people would get killed inside. Then they would go and they would find other Irish immigrants and they would hang them in gallows. And then they would go and they would kill Chinese men in their sleep. And the reason why they were called the know-nothings is because when people came up to them and said, hey, do you know what happened here, what would they say? We know nothing. And that was what that phrase became known as. So basically, if you'll put next to the know nothings, these were the extreme violent attacks on the immigrants. And you did not hide the fact that you were no, uh, know nothing. It's very similar to the KKK today. They don't hide the fact that they're in the KKK. So people said they were know nothings, but you could never prove it of did they murder people or not. So this political, uh, this flag is the flag of the know-nothings. It's an extremely popular sourcing um, that you'll see on the AP exam. You can see Native Americans, again referring to white Anglo-Saxon Americans, beware of foreign influence. The ends are backwards because that is a traditional uh, symbol of the know-nothing party as they flip the ends. Now up at the very top of this side of your paper, of the front side, we skip this section at the beginning, so the front side of your paper at the top. Really, there's not a lot I will say here, simply because there's not a lot to talk about. This is a key concept. I've never seen an essay on it. I've hardly ever, ever seen a multiple choice on it. So all you have to know about it is if it ever asks about what happened to the Mexicans in California following the Mexican session, I would just star the first bullet. All you gotta know is they lost a whole bunch of power because the Americans are now in power. All right, and let's go ahead and let's open up your assignment that you should have opened up earlier. And let's move over into your new notes. All right, so you should have your assignment pulled up at the very top. So we are now moving into the causes of the Civil War. So I want you to imagine that I have just given you either a Causes of the Civil War essay or I have given you an essay on slavery from 1820 on. Now, at the top of your assignment, it asks you to create the historical context. What I want you to think of is five terms that you could use for historical context. You are not writing a historical context. You are just brainstorming historical context in an essay that begins in 1820. And I want you to notice 1820. That's really important because your essay begins there. It can't include it in the historical context. Okay? Now, you can work with people around you if you would like to brainstorm, but come up with five things 
must relate to either slavery or something along those lines prior to 1820. Ready, go. Just type it. You don't have to define it. You just type a list. Ready, go. Douglas is way after 1820. After 1820. Black belt can work, but it depends on what the essay prompt is. Because if the essay prompt is about slavery during the time period, you're probably going to want to use that as an evidence point instead of historical context. If it's a, sla a civil war, then yeah. Yeah, you can put it in your list. Just know that it's not a catch-all. It depends on the essay prompt. What date is it, though? That's where it gets tricky. Yeah, you have to connect it to your essay prompt. Your essay prompt is on slavery or causes of the Civil War. African Americans don't get the right to vote until 1965. Take about one more minute. All right. Okay, let's brainstorm as a group of what would have worked and what wouldn't have worked. So what is one term that somebody put down? Name one. Yeah. Um, the differences between free states and slave states. The problem is, I, I guess you could have. You could have probably talked about um, where slaves are going to be at and where they concentrate. However, Missouri compromises what changes it. What's up? Um, there was a mishap with the list on the debate, so I'm staying. Well, are you supposed to leave? Um, no, because they didn't have my name on the list, so I can't compete. Like the competition or Mr. Henry? Like, I'm excused, but he didn't. So I was supposed to be double entered, but I only got entered into one event. Okay. So I'm missing the one that's today. Okay, but you're competing like tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, got it. All right, yeah. Yeah, the cotton gin, that would be a good one. So the cotton gin is a great example. I would say it's probably the best one that you could use for this time period. Black belt has a little asterisk next to it. Black belt would work great for a causes of the Civil War essay, but depending on what your essay prompt is, you might want to use that as an evidence point. It just depends on how your essay is written. Uh, the first one that we used, which one did you use? Uh, it's like the differences between slave and free. I think that one's a little bit more broad because it becomes more specific after 1820. Um, but you could have used it depending on how you wrote it. Yeah. Missouri. What's the problem with Missouri Compromise? It's in 1820, which is during your essay, so you can't use it. Three-fifths compromise works good. What else? Exchange. I would go further than a Columbia exchange because specifically about slaves. The of the international, slave trade. international slave trade or the banning of the international slave trade would have worked great. What else? What about this thing? Triangular trade. So instead of Colombian exchange, I would do triangular trade. Okay, so those are all some really good examples of what you could be able to use as a historical context on an essay.
So now what I want you to do is we've already talked about this topic. We've already talked about this topic, but I want you to go ahead and start on document A. So with document A, what you're going to be looking at is I want you to look, read the, read the document and then answer the questions. So read the document and answer the questions. Take about one more minute to answer these three questions. document, where is the boundary line according to the document? What does it say? Yeah, it's like the 36 latitude. So you notice it's very specific, right? It's not like above this area. It's very, very specific. And what is it going to ban? What two things is it going to ban? Slavery, Slavery and? And then to servitude. And then what is the exception to that rule? Yeah, oh, what's that? So uh, it talks about the fugitive slaves in there too, but if you also notice, it also talks a little bit about um, like criminals and different things like that. So one of the things that the Missouri Compromise did, and it does a lot of fugitive slaves, which we're going to bring up a lot later. Uh, so what it's going to do is it's going to ban that slavery. So you should already know this because we already talked about it. So the Missouri Compromise is going to admit Maine as a free state. Missouri is a slave state and creates an imaginary line with the north being no slaves and the south being slave. If you will please star this and put next to this historical context, HC, depending on when your essay begins, the Missouri Compromise is probably the best historical context for a slavery or a Civil War essay, except if it includes 1820. Yeah. What is the exception? 
So the exception to that is um, if you are a criminal. So for example, in the early 1900s, somebody sued and said that you can't uh, put me in jail because that's considered slavery and slavery is illegal. And so there's exceptions to that rule of when they can confine you. So in terms of slavery in the early to mid 1800s, slavery is going to, if you will star the first bullet, massively increase after the cotton gin and at the start of the market revolution. So the cotton gin gets created, slavery massively begins, and this also begins the beginning of what is called the slave revolts. So if you will star that fourth bullet, the slave revolts are going to be when they are going to revolt and attempt to get away from their masters. Now there's two major slave revolts that you are going to hear about. The Prosser Rebellion is the first attempt. Now we've actually uh, talked about him previously. Do you guys remember when I talked about the soccer field that had all the bodies in it? That's where he gets hung after his rebellion. So he tries to rebel, it works for a couple of hours, he gets squashed, he gets executed. Now the other one though, is if you will highlight and star, is Nat Turner. And if you want to use him on an essay, if you want to put next to his uh, name, 1830s, as long as you know that around the 1830s is going to be when this rebellion is. So if your essay is past 1830, you can't use this. If it's before, you can. But Nat Turner is going to get several different slaves. They uprise against their slave masters. Once they have uprised, then they are going to go on a three-month rampage killing about 78 people who are white and slaveholders. So if you want to put next to Nat Turner, this is the most successful slave rebellion. However, three months later, he gets captured and executed. The reason why that is so important is because it actually is considered the most successful slave rebellion, but it results in the heaviest restrictions on slaves yet. So successful, but heavily restricts the slaves. So let's move into why people began to advocate to get rid of slavery in America. I want you to go ahead and read the next document and then answer the question.
All right, so this document is a bit hard. Um, I've seen a lot of students have, have been struggling with this question. So first off, who's ever heard of the phrase before of um, uh, eat and drink for tomorrow we die? Has anybody heard of something similar to that before? Anybody know where it comes from? So it's actually a quote in the Bible. It's actually a scripture mastery if you're into that. Uh, so when we talk about uh, that phrase, first off, it talks about the happiness of the slaves. Does he say the slaves are truly happy? No, he says and said that they are what's called mirthful. And mirth uh, and being mirthful is a bit different. So it says, uh, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Anybody have any guesses of what that can mean, that phrase? Who wants to be brave? Yes? Um, they're going to like do as much as they can. Like, if, or they're going to like eat and drink as much as if it's their last day on earth. Almost. Yeah, kind of like that. Uh, they don't have a lot to look forward to in general, and they're always, like, could be killed because of their masters and stuff. Like, they're punished, they're usually, like, pretty killed or, like, punished. And so food and drinking and eating is, like, what they get to look forward to. Yeah, so it's almost like everything is awful in the world, so we might as well just try our best. Did you have something to add? Yeah, it means, like, doesn't matter what we do now, because tomorrow's the end. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and so what happens here is it's kind of an idea of when you look at a slave, it's kind of like being in AP. And let's pretend you come to AP and you're sitting here, but your mind is off at some other place. You're texting on your phone. You're distracted. Physically, you're here, but are you mentally here? No. So it's kind of like with this happiness, right? Are you really happy? No, but you're going to try your best to at least live through it because you never know what could happen to it tomorrow. So I want you to go ahead and read the next document, which is an extremely famous document. And I want you to read this document, and this phrase is one of the most famous phrases in American history. All right, so in this document, which is by Sojourner Truth, so she is black, and she is talking about this idea of ain't I a woman. What does it mean when she says ain't I a woman? What do you think? Yes? I think you heard the man saying, like, a woman like, should be treated like, very well, like, help every time. Um, like, she's not, like, she's helping other people, like, she's doing other everything. Yeah, and so what is her problem with that? What is she meaning by that ain't I a woman, then? If you're not being treated like a woman, right? So I want you to imagine, for example, let's pretend that we have a fire drill. And we go outside and we start to come in and somebody is holding the door open for everybody. And the minute that they see you, they slam the door in your face. Okay, right? In this case scenario, all of these women are being helped and an African-American is working as a slave, working hard in the hot soil, and yet 
Are they being treated like a woman at all? No. So it's the idea of like this difference between the two. So the last document that I want you to, um, to do is go ahead and do the next document. You know this guy before. It's William Lloyd Garrison. Remember, what does he write? The Liberator. And what uh, is the Liberator? You guys remember? It's an abolitionist newspaper. I remember William Lloyd Garrison is what race? He's white. Okay. So go ahead and read his. All right, so with this document, notice how it talks about like kind of his encouragement and things like that. And what does he say that slavery is similar to? Do you guys remember the document? It's like a burning house, right? Now, all of these are examples of abolitionists. And if you guys remember, abolitionists want to eliminate what? Slavery, slavery exactly. And so what they're going to do is they are going to want to be able to eliminate that slavery. So ways that they are going to eliminate that slavery so first you have what are known as the radical abolitionists. Those are going to be the ones that are going to say that uh, slavery is the most evil, awful thing in the world and must be ended immediately and completely. You also have the free soilers, which say it's not necessarily slavery that's the problem. The problem is what are we going to do into all these territories? And the final is labor competition. If uh, you're going to release all the slaves, well then what about our laborers in the north? Are they going to lose their jobs? So if you will go ahead and bracket these and put know the differences, you need to be able to know the differences between these different ones. So now we're going to begin to move into westward expansion. What impact does westward expansion have on this time period? So I want you to go ahead and read document E and then answer the question.
So according to this document, the concern over slavery is having to do with that westward expansion. Now, if you notice, what do they compare slavery to? Is murder, right? It's the same exact level. Now, if you guys notice, they said, what power does the government have? What does it have to do? To abolish it, right? And so all these debates begin to occur about whether or not we should abolish slavery in these territories. Now, I want you to go ahead and read the next one. It's quite short. I want you to go ahead and read the next one and then answer the question. Let's see if you can figure it out. So according to this document, what part of America are they referring to where slavery should be banned? What do you think? The Mexican Session, right? So everything we got from the Mexican-American War. Now, this is uh, what is known as, if you will star this on your paper, the Wilmot Proviso. And the Wilmot Proviso had the goal, if you will highlight, of the Mexican-American War, if you want to put next to that, the Mexican Session. Its goal was to take everything that we acquired following the Mexican-American War and prohibit slavery in those territories. So if you want to highlight prohibited slavery in any territory acquired by Mexico. Now, obviously, how do you feel like the Southern Democrats felt about this? They hated it, right? This was awful and terrible. Why should we do this? And so it dies in the Senate, but what you need to know is it's two major impacts. If you want to put next to number one, it divides politics into the issue of slavery. So if you ever get an essay question that says, uh, what led to debates over slavery? This is a really, really good one. And then number two is this also began the creation of new political parties. And in particular, the major political party that this is going to lead to is going to be the creation of the Republican Party. So if you will star the Republican Party, the Republican Party mostly gets formed on the idea of freedom of everything, free soil, free speech, free labor, and free men. But really what happens is as time goes on, this begins to all revolve around the issue of slavery. So if you notice, this is the two platforms. So on one side of the platform, you have that the platform is for the white man. Now, on the other side, you are voting for somebody who's black as a Republican. So if you'll make sure to highlight on your paper that this is mostly going to be the Whigs. The Whigs at this point are about to die off when Henry Clay dies. And if you will make sure to highlight that it was anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. um, also highlight Free Soil Party. Should probably include that. Now, we will continue this next class period. So you go ahead and put your stuff away, put my computer